Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I will begin as everybody's finding their seats and let you know that our, our annual meetings are about education and the Academy makes a concerted effort to fund travel for corresponding and student members to gain knowledge in our annual meetings. At this time, I would like to recognize the various scholarship recipients attending this year. We have 17 international scholarship recipients from the following countries, Sri Lanka, Brazil, India, Moldova, Uganda, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Ukraine, Turkey, Korea, Netherlands, Israel, Mexico, Egypt. We have 23 scholarships were awarded to student members of the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developed Medicine. And finally, we have six travel scholarships funded by orthopediatrics. At this time, I would ask that the scholarship recipients please stand so we can welcome you with a round of applause. Please stand. It's so exciting to see you all here. Our next lectureship and award is the Kathleen Lyle Murray Foundation um, Award. This was established in 1975 by Margaret O. Murray and Clark O. Murray of Kansas City. Their daughter Kathleen, born with cerebral palsy and was uh, severely disabled, uh, spurred on their dedicated lifelong commitment to enhancing the lives of individuals with multiple and severe handicaps. Kathleen passed away at the age of 12 in 1962. The Murrays were very active in the Kansas City United Cerebral Palsy Association, and Mrs. Murray became the national president in the 1970s. She was also a member of the National Advisory Council on Developmental Disabilities in Washington, D.C., started the first daycare center for severely disabled uh, children at their local church, and was instrumental in establishing what is now the Leanne Britton Infant Developmental Center in the Shawnee Mission Medical Center in the, in the Shawnee Mission, Kansas. She was a tireless organizer and administrator for the rights and education of uh, children with disabilities until her passing in 2001. The Murray's, Murray's son, Brian, has upheld the position of administrator of the foundation since that time, carrying on his family's desire and dedication on the behalf of the persons with disabilities. This year's recipient of this award is Jason Benetti. Jason's a television sports play-by-play -play announcer who, is, who also has cerebral palsy. He currently does play-by-play -play locally in Chicago for Major League Baseball's White Sox. He's also a play-by-play -play announcer nationally for ESPN, where he's called uh, Major League Baseball, College Football, Basketball, Baseball, Lacrosse, and also the uh, Special Olympics World Games. He's been featured on television on the nightly, on NBC Nightly News and CNN and in print, in the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the Security Post, amongst many others. And I um, uh, also Googled him and you can find him all over that. <laughs> he holds a Juris, but, but, wasn't this? He holds a Juris Doctorate from Wake Forest uh, School of Law. Um, because of his disability, Jason walks with a limp and one of his eyes drifts. In having the disability, Jason has encountered life from an angle at which most people um, do not. Perception of Jason has led to his understanding that one trait does not define a person. His speeches include his experiences as, as a member of the sports media with a disability and the situations and relationships which stem from his observations. At this time, I'd like to present Jason Benetti. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How are we? Good. Um, 
Before I get moving, I would like to begin by sharing a video that I've collaborated with the Cerebral Palsy Foundation and Richard Ellenson on uh, that will debut at some point in the coming months. You can go ahead and roll the video. And I've learned as a sports announcer that if the video doesn't roll right away, I just have to keep talking. <laughs> so I think they're just testing me back there, guys, right? There we go. Hi, I'm Jason Benetti, your friendly Chicago TV sports announcer with Awkward Moments. Brought to you by the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Last week, I go into the airport with my walk, and at the start of pre-check, uh, the guy in uniform says to me, can I help? This is pre-check. Do you know how that works? Now, there's something truly thoughtful about that, right? Except it's also kind of like he's thinking that my walk means I can't understand things like going through a line. Which, by the way, I do really well. I'm like a 9 out of 10 in lines. Yeah, I'm good, I say, which is really the last thing I wanted to say. But the answer came out so polite, the guy says, good for you. So I say, thanks. And I do the huge smile head nod, like a bobblehead doll, a very agreeable one. And he and I have just experienced the I wish I had a time machine to redo this incredibly awkward moment moment. Oh well. On the plus side, if I'm running late, maybe somebody will give me a ride in one of those crazy golf carts I hear so much about. Whee! Help CPF create and share the messages that make the world a little less awkward for all of us. This is Jason Benetti with Awkward Moments. And I very much look forward to having one with you. So thanks very much to Richard and his creative team for helping create that as well. Uh, I'm very excited about the series just starting in a, in a couple of months. And thank you all for clapping for it so we didn't have to have an awkward moment <laughs> where I harass you into clapping for things that I've collaborated on. Um, so two things basically about this talk. Uh, number one, if you care to not look at me and just look at the monitors, I'm used to that because everybody watches me on the television instead of talk to me in person anyway. And then number two, if my jokes are terrible and you don't laugh, that's what I'm used to because I don't hear the audience reaction ever. So I'll just think you're trying to make me feel at home. And it's a really nice catch-22 for you because you think everything that I say is funny in that case. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, Richard. Pity laugh from row two. Um, but again, the rest of you are just making me feel at home. So, the TV industry is a very interesting one. I started in radio, and I'll take you through why I started as a member of the media in the first place, and it has to do with getting exposed to sports play-by-play -play very early in my life. But I want to start with a moment that I had a couple of years ago when I was just beginning working with ESPN. I was in my third season as a play-by-play -play announcer for the company, but I'd only done basketball, and my hope was that I could grow to do basketball and football and baseball and a wide variety of sports, like a lot of the guys that I've grown up watching, Sean McDonough, Ian Eagle, those types of guys uh, do. So ESPN had given me the first year about four games, the next year about 10 games, the year after that about 20 games, and I just signed a contract so I could start doing football. So I got invited to a room very much like this one. It was in Bristol, Connecticut, just off of Bristol actually, in, in Hartford, near where ESPN is located, at a hotel. And so I knew one thing that ESPN might be a little rough around the edges about with my work. I knew they liked my work. I, I felt I was growing within the company, and this is not a ding on them, but I did think that there was a, a sect of the population there that might have an issue with the fact that I'm a TV announcer, and I, like, can't look directly into a camera. Uh, because one of my eyes goes this way, and one's this way, and, like, I have the best peripheral vision in American history, but that doesn't help as somebody who needs to look directly at the camera. It's great for like what's going on in lane six. Um, so I'm in a room like this one, and I find out that there is somebody who's in charge 
of making you look good. It's essentially somebody to coordinate how you dress, somebody who's an image consultant had flown up from Texas to speak to the large group. And so the person who's in charge of signing contracts at ESPN to hire quote unquote talent, and they say talent without the air quotes in my industry, but like, I think that's needless. So talent, uh, that, that's what they call announcers. And I think it's sarcastic, but nobody's ever figured it out. So they, um, they have this image consultant and she comes up to the stage and she's talking about some small things you can do to make yourself look better on camera at the beginning of a game, right? At the beginning of a game, you see, we come on camera, we say hello and do happy talk and all that stuff. So I find out that she's also doing, from somebody next to me actually at the seminar, she's also doing individual meetings with people. And I was like, oh great, I can go have like a very candid, honest meeting with this woman. So she's giving her speech and one of the things she says to the large group is, the one thing I would steer away from when it comes to ties is don't wear too bright of ties because it detracts from your facial features and people won't be paying attention to what you're saying, they'll be locked in on that psychedelic tie you're wearing. I thought, okay, that's, you know, that's good advice, and she gave a couple other pieces of advice, so I go and meet her individually and have a 15-minute session, and one of the things I said was, hey, what do you suggest about taking some focus off my eyes? And the first thing she said, which I thought was very valuable, was take off your glasses when you're on camera which I, I did for a while uh, until I realized I can't see anything without <laughs> my glasses. Uh, but in the moment, it was good advice, and it is good advice, except for the whole, the whole sight thing. So, <laughs> tiny, teeny thing. Uh, so I did that for a while, but then the second thing she says to me is, you know, I would wear brighter ties. <laughs> and I thought, did, but you, didn't you say, and I said to her, but didn't you say, I, I had the guts or stupidity to say, but didn't you just say to the large group, hey, don't wear so bright of ties? And she says, yeah, but we really want to accentuate the positive features. <laughs> Which is evidently like my lower neck area, <laughs> like that. That's like the gleaming beacon of beauty when it comes to me. It's an interesting thing being in a profession where you get the immediate focus upon you and who you are when you're somebody who doesn't always think of that image in the most positive way. But there are also people who totally get it. Uh, this is an image consultant, that was her job, right? That's her goal, is to try and help. She was actually trying to give me pointers. She was trying to be helpful. I don't remember her for that re reason, uh, particularly, but she was, she was just trying to help. And, and so I found that my life has become this litany of moments which are colored by both people who really get it and people who really don't and it's kind of trying to make something of all of that. So, I, when I was in junior high, I had this teacher named Mr. Menig. He was the shop teacher at James Hart Junior High School in Homewood, Illinois. And when I got the White Sox job, I mentioned Mr. Menig as somebody who was terribly helpful to me. And I was telling a story to a member of the media about Mr. Menig, uh, a couple years, right when I got the job, a year and a half ago. So I tell this story about Mr. Menig, who was the basketball coach for the seventh and eighth graders at the time. And Mr. Menig, instead of making me just a manager with the team to go pick up basketballs and put them in, in some container and you know, do laundry or whatever it is like a manager typically does, Mr. Menig saw that I cared about basketball and I cared about sports, and he decided that he was gonna call me his assistant coach. So I was the assistant coach for the junior high basketball team. And I think it's this wonderful thing looking back on it because he decided that I, he wasn't just going to put me in the basket for people with disabilities because it would be easy to give me some job and let me go run. He gave me responsibility 
And he let me sit next to him on the bench, and I called plays. I, had, I was in seventh grade. Like, I hadn't even read To Kill a Mockingbird yet. So, like, I, I don't really know what a zone defense is, but I've learned from sports announcers, and as you know, we're smarter than everybody. Uh, so I tell this story about Mr. Menig, but I also tell the story about this kid, I'm telling this to the Chicago media, about this kid uh, who I won't name because I don't think it's fair to him, but I, I vividly remember him coming up to me in gym class and saying, you know why Mr. Menig made you an assistant coach, right? And I said, well, no. He goes, because he feels sorry for you. And I told this story when I got the White Sox job and I got this text from Mr. Menig and he was crestfallen because he wanted me to be sure that he didn't just give me the job because he felt bad for me. And maybe that's a piece of it, but he decided that he was gonna reach out and let me know that that certainly was not the case. And I felt awful because he felt awful. And he was the first of, of many people to really care in an elevated way about me and to see the exception that I was in a different way than most people did at first blush. Then I get to high school and there's a high school radio station, so you all know what it's like. I'm sure a lot of you got exposed to medicine early on or whatever your career path became. You get exposed to it early and then you just kind of want to become it. And for me, who does TV now and has to deal with all the people telling me to wear Jerry Garcia ties, uh, <laughs> I, I get exposed to high school radio and I'm sitting there and I'm just announcing games and nobody can see me and I was too dopey at the time to know that it was because the inhibitions were gone that I loved it so much, but I did love it and it was something that I learned to care about creatively. But there was also some autonomy there. I had a teacher named Mr. Comstock and another one named Mrs. Tipton who basically, every time we went in with a script of some kind, they would hammer it out with us and they wouldn't tiptoe around me not having something be good because they knew that I wanted to be really good at this instead of just another guy with a disability. They, they didn't single me out at the right times, is what I'm saying. So I get exposed to this very early. I go to college for it. I become the sports director at the campus radio station, WAER, where Marv Albert has been, and Sean McDonough, and Mike Tirico, and all these people. And they put me in charge of the thing, which, again, I had read To Kill a Mockingbird at that time, but I was still an idiot. So I'm deciding where everybody goes and when everybody does things. And there was one person who was really, really mad that I got the job because I felt, he felt like I was going to give him short shrift when it came to the assignments that I was doling out. And at that time, we had AOL Instant Messenger. You all know AOL Instant Messenger? You put up an away message and somebody types something to you and it sends it right back and it, it's like a window into your soul from the early 2000s. So I'm online at one point and I look at this away message from this kid, he's a senior in college, and it says, at least he'll be a nice story for somebody's magazine one day. It's an absolute shot at me, claim, at me, essentially he's claiming that I got the job because I was a nice story, which is the kid from junior high all over again, right? And I, I had met a bunch of friends who I'm very close with still. I have maybe five core friends from college who I, I would do just about anything for. And they, they basically said, don't worry about it, which is a very hard thing to do when you're still dealing with you not knowing whether or not you're really good at something. Um, and so I got through it, but as you can see, I haven't forgotten that moment, and maybe that's a referendum on me. But as, as I got better and better and got advice from people, and the funny thing about advice in this industry, in the, in the radio industry for me was, I send out tapes to people, they had no idea what I walk like, none. They, they have no interest in that even, because it's radio. So they're not looking at that. And I got some great advice from a lot of great people, and I got some interesting uh, reactions from people when they saw me. I went to speak at the university at one point, and I walked in, and the professor introduced me, and one student audibly said, you're Jason Benetti? It's like, oh, thank you for the warm welcome. That's very, very nice of you, really appreciate it. Uh, I had a scout when I was doing minor league baseball after I had graduated. Scout says to me, hey, uh, what you got? You got polio? Didn't we eradicate that? <laughs> like, I, 
I don't know, but I think we eradicated polio, sir. I also had another minor league baseball manager. Uh, how many of you have seen The Usual Suspects, the movie? Uh, manager called me uh, Kaiser Sose. Uh, and those of you who have seen the movie, you can explain it to everybody else, but essentially it's Kevin Spacey's character who begins walking with a limp and then ends the movie not walking with a limp. So I thought, yeah, I, I, yeah I'll take Kaiser Sose. Uh, except for the whole devil thing that he is, we learn. So I, I have some people who hire me to do minor league baseball radio and they were fantastic to me. And at the same time, I have the, the polio guy reminding me that like, hey, you walk with a limp and that might be an issue at some point. So I had never really done TV. And in Syracuse, I was doing the AAA baseball team. I get hired to do their games. And part of their deal is I, I get 20 TV games. So they hire me to do t television play-by-play -play in part. And I do some games. And one of the producers there, his name's Pete Gaines. He's one of the most wonderful people I've ever met says, I don't really care what you look like on TV. I want to try and get you in to do high school football on our television network. And so I'm living in North Carolina at the time, going to law school. They fly me up and back to do play-by-play -play for high school football, and that's how I got the experience. But one of his bosses was not real keen on the idea, thought that there was not enough makeup to put on <laughs> this to get it on television. And Pete fought for me really hard. And that type of person has been uh, what's propped me up in this career more often than not. So right around that time, the stories were starting to come out. Sarah listed some of the places where I've, and I thank you for Googling me, but that's very personal. Um, I can't believe you admitted it, frankly. Uh, <laughs> clear history. Uh, so, at that time, people are starting to write stories about, hey, this guy has CP and he does games as well. And uh, I was sitting in a law school classroom at Wake Forest, actually, and the journalist Viv Bernstein was there. And we got to talking, and she asked me this question. She said, is there a ceiling for you in television? And I thought, I have no idea. Like, I, I don't know. That's not for me to choose, I guess. But I never really thought of it like that. Maybe I was naive, whatever it might be. But that has been kind of ringing in my ears when I encounter somebody who asks about a tie and things like that and, and, and taking off your glasses and just trying to make it look better. Or when I get a tweet from somebody that says, hey, Jason, look at me. Well, be two of you, and I will look at you. Like, that's, it's on you with the cloning problem you have. Um, so. Right after that seminar, bringing it back to a couple years ago where I started with that seminar, a couple months after that, I'm in South Bend, Indiana. I'm going to a Buffalo Wild Wings after a game because if you're in TV production after games, you go have wings and beer. That's what you do, uh, evidently, I've learned. Um, so we're walking into Buffalo Wild Wings and the producer, a gentleman by the name of Eric Poseman says, hey, uh, when you rent a car, do you need any accommodation? And I said, I actually appreciate you asking. Uh, no, I don't. I, I just drive like I drive. We sat at that bar for an hour and a half and talked about the craft of calling games, how much we enjoyed doing the game that night, and all of this, just like kind of pouring it all out, being very honest about being a play-by-play -play announcer with cerebral palsy. The next morning, I wake up to an email from Eric to five to six bigwigs in ESPN's home office. Basically saying, I like working with this guy. We need to get this right. Let's get him more games. I mean, if that doesn't put a smile on your face about humanity and about curiosity and about interest in taking some smart risks, I don't know what does. And the, the, the Pete Gaines and the Bill Menigs and, and the Eric Posemans of the world and all of these people who have hired me over the course of time, Jerry Reinsdorf with the White Sox, everybody who's done that has taken a risk. And I perceive it, because I'm a little biased in the situation, I perceive it to be a smart risk. But because they've been curious, because they've taken a chance, they've allowed me to not feel singular for the wrong reason. Every time you have someone that might have odds that are negative, every time you have an outlier, 
spending time on that outlier sometimes will lead to grand results for that person. And I know some of my doctors are in the building here, and it is just unreal for me to be in this room considering the way I was treated growing up as a positive outlier and a surprise in a really good way to people who I've encountered. And yeah, there are all of the, like, I, I don't like when, when I hear people say, oh, you can make it, everything's gonna be great without the understanding that there are gonna be some people that say, you have this job because you're a token. You have this job because somebody felt sorry for you. That is something that will hit you in the media or in interactions, but the level of curiosity and honesty that comes from true humanity is what has made me. Maybe there's some inherent talent, but I've run into so many people who are so understanding of what surprises and diversity actually are that it's completely heartwarming. And I was in a FedEx office in Chicago a couple of weeks ago, and I ran into somebody. I didn't actually careen into someone. But with my walk, I need to clarify that. Sometimes that happens. Uh, there was a gentleman there who said, hey, I know Jerry Reinsdorf, who's the, the chairman of the White Sox. And, and we got to talking a little bit. And he said, you know, I went up to Jerry. I was in his suite the other day. And I said to him, what a great story Jason is. Like, it's amazing that you guys hire. And Jerry actually stopped him mid-sentence, according to the guy, and said, no, he's a great announcer. And I, it was very, the windshield wipers on my glasses needed to work because I was in public, but there's this moment where you say people actually have gotten to the point where it's announcer first. And I think that's what we're striving for with all of us, is the understanding that the disability is something, but it's not the only thing. And getting past that with curiosity and questions, even when we know the realm that we're in, that's A number one. And I'll close with a story from one of our telecasts recently that is not at all about me because I've spent 22 minutes talking about me and it's exhausting uh, for you. <laughs> uh, so I, um, the other night at a White Sox game, a ball gets hit into the left field corner and our camera follows it and we follow it watching on the monitor. And this boy, 15 or 16 years old, goes rushing for the ball goes in front of this woman, an adult woman, picks up the ball and has it as a souvenir. She walks over to him and basically must have said, show me the ball because he stuck out his hand. And she, without going finger by finger, uh, took the ball out of his hand and just walked away with it. So we spent like a minute and a half on this larceny on our telecast, but well, the White Sox are in last place, so we may not have if the record was different, but we're rebuilding, and rightfully so. And we, uh, Rick Hahn, the general manager, is here to explain that to you. No, no. Uh, so the, um, the kid has the ball taken away, and Steve Stone, my partner, and I are joking around about it. And hey, he says, well, he showed her the ball. That's his own fault and all this stuff. Well, I get a text from the marketing guy after we do a replay of it. Brooks Boyer is the head of marketing for the White Sox. And he says, should we give the kid a ball? I said, absolutely. Bring it up, Steve and I will sign it. Brooks brings up a ball, we sign it. Brooks goes back into the corner, brings the kid the ball, we air it. Kid has a smile on his face. We've made somebody's day. We didn't even know the half of it. So Steve and I are walking out of the ballpark. The kid, Ryan, Ryan Baker, and one of his family members were, was with him. And they said, hey, uh, they were waiting for us as we walked out, they said, hey, uh, we really appreciate what you did. We take a picture. We say yes. I get to the ballpark a couple days later. Brooks tells me, Ryan is here again. And I said, what for? And I said, WGN News is doing a story on him. It had blown up. So Ryan ends up coming to the booth that day. He gets a bunch of signatures from, from players and front office people. And uh, so Ryan comes up to the booth. We have him on camera one more time. We chat a little bit. Well, the next day, his dad sends an email to the Sox front office and says, you don't know what you did. Uh, Ryan's mom has multiple sclerosis. The day after the ball thing happened was his first day in high school in his sophomore year. He was like the talk of the town. And his mom, you know, 
ostensibly had a smile on her face and, and Ryan had as much of a day as he's ever had. But if our producer doesn't go to the replay, if our director doesn't stay on the shot, if the cameraman doesn't stay on the shot, if we don't talk about it, if Brooks doesn't go down with the ball, if any of those curious things, if any of those, hey, I just wonder what's beyond the facade, if any of those don't happen, she's just another lady with MS and he's just another kid who has less of a childhood because he has to deal with so many things going on at home. I don't want to meddle for that, and our crew doesn't either, but the level of curiosity shown by everybody in that group is exactly what has made me what I am today, and I think what makes you all the empathetic and understanding people you are, but we all can use a reminder every once in a while. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the award. Yeah. Good questions. Sounds good. I'll just do this little photo option. Right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. What do you want? Ah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just that. Jason has time. <clears throat> time for a couple of questions from the audience. I can't imagine there aren't questions. Who's going to get to the mic? Oh, somebody's practically, let's see, any questions? They're trampling each other to ask questions. <laughs> yes, it's trampling. I'm sorry for the safety hazard. Oh, look, hazard somebody, folks. Steve, go ahead. Will the White Sox be better next year? <laughs> Steve, please go away, thank you. We're looking at 2019. Any real questions? Yes. I can't believe you didn't give a spoiler alert for Usual Suspects. Uh, it's, been, it's, it's been since the 80s. If you haven't seen it yet, get to your local family video. Like, sorry I ruined it. Also, here's the end of Casablanca. Like, they get on the plane. Like, what? <laughs> I'll ask again any real questions. <laughs> Yeah. You know, at this society, we very much um, recognize difference and the value of understanding brain plasticity and human capabilities and courage. One of the dilemmas that I currently see is that in sports, the national pastime is football, which you don't announce and cover. And there's a lot of things going on with what happens to those individuals who are getting repetitive CNS hits. Would you comment on how you would see the role of media either not playing ostrich or figuring out a strategy on how to do balance so that we don't have to see previous very great individuals be like Muhammad Ali. As I, I, do, I do cover football, I, um, I'm actually flying from here to Charlottesville, Virginia for a UConn UVA football game. Um, and I, it, is such, it is such, such a hot button topic. And uh, one of my former colleagues, Ed Cunningham, has been in the media being very critical about uh, football and its role, and, and I, I'm simply of the opinion that the research is terribly important, and being as safe as humanly possible while playing the sport is paramount. I, I know that there are elevated, seriously elevated risks in football, and, and I'm not going to be the one to decide for parents what game their kids should or shouldn't play. And, and the, one, the one thing that I do have in my heart about football that is, whether it's backward or not, whether it is hopeful or not, we all can make our own decision. But I covered high school football for a couple years for ESPN, and I had a number of players who were in the ESPN 300 top prospects say to me, I chose football because it's the way out. And I think there's a systemic situation there more than just football itself. Um, 
if that's the only way out in somebody's mind. Whether that's right or wrong, I got that response a number of times from young people in, in major football hotbeds. So I carry that along with me, and I kind of feel like parents should make the decision on their own while we should strengthen the safety of, of football as much as humanly possible. Thank you. And I know we could just go on and on, but we're going to have to close this session. Thank you, Jason. If you'd all, I'm, I'm on the 615 to LaGuardia. If you'd like to jump on the plane, we'll do questions. <laughs> <Just your> questions. <laughs> thank you all for having me, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you. Thank you. I have so many favorite parts to this program, but here comes another one. This is. An honor for me to present um, our next speaker, who is somebody I don't really know the world without. <laughs> um, Dr. John Lonstein is my dad's partner, but to the Winter children, he's my parents' good and possibly best friend. Um, I grew up washing dishes with John Lonstein. <laughs> behind all those parties that perhaps some of you went to at my parents' home, uh, the fellows' welcome dinner, the traveling fellows' goodbye dinner. Um, we, we bonded over many dishes and many life experiences. But John also has an impressive professional um, biography. He graduated from the University of Witwatersrand Medical School. I have no idea if I said that right. In 1964, in 1967, he moved to the United States to complete a general surgery residency and at Boston University Medical Center. But shortly uh, thereafter, he changed his focus and entered the orthopedic residency program at the University of Minnesota. He became a member of the orthopedic department at the university and started an electronic collection of spine deformity um, records, uh, which developed into a comprehensive uh, spine database. His research output comprises over 200 publications, 37 book chapters, presentations in 40 countries. I think half of those trips my parents were on with you. He's one of the authors of Moe's textbook of scoliosis and other spine deformities with the first edition in 1978 and two subsequent editions. He served on four AAOS and six SRS committees. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, and he served as the SRS president in 1991 for the Silver Anniversary in Minneapolis. He's a member of the AACPDM, served as the chairman of the Scientific Program Committee in 1989 to 91, and helped establish and is currently the editor-in-chief of Spine Deformity, the official journal of the Scoliosis Research Society. I present to you Dr. John Lonstein. Yeah. Before I start, I don't know if Jason is still here, but when I chose my tie for today, it was between this one and a Jerry, a Jerry Garcia tie. <laughs> and for people who know me and the people at Gillette, those are the only ties I wear. Uh, I'd like to thank Sarah for this invitation. While I was putting the talk together, I realized we've known each other for 42 years. No, sorry, 45 years. Uh, when I finished my residency and joined her father. And uh, thank you for those kind words. And I think you can all agree that her father and her mother taught her well, and she's proving it today. Uh, I've been asked to give the Gail G. Arnold lecture. Where's the button? Which is the button? Oh, there it is. Uh, Doctor, this is named for the honor of Dr. Arnold. 
He attended John Hopkins University and then the University of Maryland Medical School, who served in the U.S. Army Corps during the war and practiced in Richmond for the next 50 plus years. He was a self-taught developmental pediatrician and medical director of the Richmond CP Center. He was also clinical professor of pediatrics of the Medical College of Virginia. He was your president from 1989 to 1990 and was honored by George H.W. Bush for his years of volunteer service. The Academy has honored him with this lectureship and awards for best scientific paper. <clears throat> I'm going to cover today the history of the treatment of neuromuscular scoliosis. Neuromuscular diseases, as you all know, affect the neuromuscular system anywhere from the brain to the muscle. Scoliosis is very prevalent in neuromuscular conditions and the prevalence varies depending on the involvement of the child or adult. It can be as high as 100% in cerebral palsy, mild dysplasia with thoracic levels, and children who are paralyzed under the age of 10. Neuromuscular scoliosis is well known for having long collapsing spines with associated pelvic obliquity change in sagittal alignment and associated other conditions. The things we always compare things when we talk about scoliosis are idiopathic scoliosis because that is more prevalent. But in neuromuscular scoliosis, there's specific neuromuscular diseases, there's involvement of other systems, scoliosis is far more common, it appears earlier, and it progresses at a high rate. If we talk about treatment in general, bracing does play a role, but it's really the definitive treatment. Surgical treatment is common, and the surgery, the fusions are longer and more complex. Non-operative treatment, observation is used for children to see if they're going to develop scoliosis or to follow small curves, but other treatments are more common. The aim of non-operative treatment, for the most part, is to help the child function while they're growing. So one of the things we use a lot are you know, sitting supports, and then when we have scoliosis, we can't correct it, but we want to control it while they're growing and then fuse the spine as they hit the adolescent growth spurt. The basis of any seating system is to stabilize the base of the spine, the pelvis, and then the torso above that. And what we use depends on what the child's sitting balance is. The simplest aid is a firm seat and firm back, going on to more support with an upholster system and a custom molded system. Here's a child who's sitting in the wheelchair can only support himself sitting by using his hands. He's got pelvic obliquity, but if he's placed in a chair with a firm seat, firm back, and some thoracic support, he becomes more functional. On the left is an upholstered sitting support, and in the middle, a molded sitting support for a child who needs more support, and on the right, a TLSO. These sitting supports improve the child's function, make their, them able to use their hands, and aid in transportation. We did a survey on sitting supports and found that they improve sitting balance, improve hang function, aid in care, in transportation, and in feeding. When we start the treatment of neuromuscular scoliosis historically, it's interesting that Jason mentioned polio 
because that was the first neuromuscular condition treated. This is a child with post-polio scoliosis who's treated with a very early brace at the turn of the last century. The brace might support his spine. You can imagine what it's doing to his breathing and his growth of his thorax. The first big change in braces used for paralytic scoliosis was the Milwaukee brace. It was developed by Drs. Blount and Schmidt in Milwaukee and was used for the post-operative care of paralytic post-polio scoliosis. Just by chance, one of their post-polio patients became sick and they had to postpone surgery, but they put the, ch the child in a brace. And to the surprise, they found that the brace controlled the curve. And that was the origin of the use of the Milwaukee brace for non-operative treatment. This is an example of one of those original Milwaukee braces. A leather pelvic section, a very cumbersome uprights, and pad supported. Compare it to these modern braces, which are much more comfortable, much easier to wear, and much more functional. Orthoses used for neuromuscular deformities are the Milwaukee brace and the one star, the TLSO. They control the curve during growth. Child has a spine fusion at the growth spurt, and they use for post-operative support. This is an unusual case. This is a girl with post-polio scoliosis. Was placed in a cast, which were excellent curve correction, then was placed in a brace, and there the two on the right at the age of 18 and 18, 20 successful treatment of a post-polio scoliosis. That is rare. Generally, bracing works in controlling the curve during their growth, but at that time, they require a spinal fusion. There are problems with braces even when we use them. There can be skin problems due to pressure, and if they've got insensate skin, as you saw with a boy with post-polio scoliosis, they give a tubular thorax if not made with enough space. You can get lower rib flaring and abdominal compression interfering with breathing. So in summary, non-operative treatment does work. Sitting support and other orthoses to c control the curve and delay surgery. Surgery is the thing that we use most commonly for neuromuscular scoliosis. We use it to obtain the correction and then maintain the correction with a fusion. Our aim is a stable, balanced spine over a level pelvis. In the early days of the surgical treatment, the correction was cath correction or halofemoral correction and then surgery corrected and stabilized the spine with implants. And today, we use dual rods fixed to the spine with hooks, wires, screws, or tapes. The history of spinal fusion dates back to Russell Hibbs in New York, who did the spur first spine fusion in January 1911. He reported on his first three cases, and his technique was preoperative correction with a cast or turnbuckle, in bed 10 weeks postoperatively in a brace, and then up in a removable jacket for 6 to 12 months, a long treatment course. This is a turnbuckle cast. The child is placed in a cast for the whole body, including their legs proximal thighs, hinges are placed in the cast, and then the cast is cut and wedged to correct the deformity. Hibbs reported on his treatment 
of 427 procedures in 360 patients. Why so many procedures? Because in those days, there was no blood collection, blood salvage, blood transfusions, so that long fusions had to be done in stages. Of his 360 patients, under half, just under half, had post-polio scoliosis. His results were very impressive because in this series at that time, he had just seven deaths and 15 pseudoarthroses, something we haven't been able to get to today. Just shortly after his first publication in Canada, Galloway treated paralytic scoliosis and reported three cases. This treatment of cost correction and fusion continued until 1960, where Harrington introduced the Harrington rod, which was the first successful implant used for spine fusions. It, it consists, as you can see on the right, of a rod on the concavity of the curve fixed to the spine with hooks and the upper part of the rod has ratchets so you can ratchet the rod and correct the curve. And he also used a rod on the other side for compression to stabilize the curve. Here's the use of Harrington rods for post polio scoliosis. Boy at the age of 10 with no scoliosis got polio, 10 and a half, developed a curve which progressed and was treated with a fusion and three Harrington rods. This treatment affected people's lives dramatically. To aid in the treatment of spine deformities, we can approach the spine from the front, and this started with Dr. Hodgson's work on tuberculosis and extended to spine fusions, and then implants were added by Tony Dwyer in Australia, and he has an example of his implant, which is approaching the spine from the front, putting in vertebral body screws with a hole in the screw heads through which a cable is threaded, and then the cable is tensioned and crimped down on the screw heads, correcting the curve. He has the use of that technique in a girl with cerebral palsy scoliosis. Here are her pre-op pictures. And on the left is excellent correction of the curve with straightening of the spine. Except a principle was lost. It's not connected to the base. So without a posterior fusion, it didn't succeed. And we learned with this technique you used, needed to do anterior posterior fusions. This is a boy with very severe cerebral palsy scoliosis. The original curve is the upper left. The middle one is his progression. And then we, one on the right is a traction x-ray to show the curve correction. And here he is having a anterior fusion with Dwyer instrumentation, and then a Harrington instrumentation posteriorly. Very successful treatment. Here's a lady of 36 who presented with post-polio scoliosis with a very severe curve, and she presented both with a curve and respiratory problems. She was treated in halofemoral traction in the next picture, and then she had a posterior fusion with a Harrington rod, and after surgery was placed in a halo cast. On the right is her picture 10 years postoperatively. This is how it affected her. The curve we corrected from 200 degrees to 135 degrees. But more importantly, we increased her vital capacity and initially she was retaining carbon dioxide and we restored 
her blood values to near normal. Next big step in the treatment of neuromuscular scoliosis was segmental instrumentation where we could control the curve at every single level. This was started by Racina and Ferreira Alves in, po in Portugal who used a technique with a single rod where the spine was translated to the rod with wires which were placed at the end, at the base of the spinous process and then they had a posterior fusion. This was modified by Eduardo Luque in Mexico City who used wires that passed under the lamina rather than the spinous process sublaminar wires with dual rods. And he has the treatment of a boy with cerebral palsy scoliosis. The film on the left is sitting, a traction film, and then the dual rods wired to the spine at every level with fixation to the pelvis with a bend at the end of the rod. And here he is preoperatively and postoperatively. The rods can do other things. Here's a girl with post with cerebral palsy scoliosis, who has a fairly severe curve, but thoracic lordosis and loss of her normal thoracic space on the right is a traction film by using dual rods and contouring the rods to an anatomic thoracic kyphosis and lumbar lordosis, we can restore a normal sagittal profile. In addition here, you'll note that the two rods are connected because we found that connecting the rods made for a more stable construct. Here's a girl with Chocomarie tooth muscular dystrophy who had good sitting balance, so it wasn't necessary to go to the pelvis, and we just, I just used a single rod with sublaminar wires. We can also take the two rods, lock them together as a unit rod, and use that for correction. The, as you can see, fixation to the pelvis is very important in these cases to be able to be fixed to a stable base. It can either be by the end, bend at the end of a rod, or by a screw that goes into the pelvis, or a bend at the end of the rod that goes over the ilium. An alternative way to fix scoliosis associated with cerebral palsy or any neuromuscular edition is to use sublaminar tapes rather than wires. These are tapes that are passed under the lamina. They're fixed to a clamp attached to the rod these clamps are tensioned and then a screw sets the tension. Anterior fusions have become less common in the treatment of neuromuscular scoliosis because as you can see, we've got very, very powerful posterior implants. But they still play a role when we treat hyperkyphosis, hyperlordosis, or when there are no posterior elements like myelomeningocele or post-laminectomy. Here's a girl with, post, with uh, cerebral palsy scoliosis with severe thoracic kyphosis and a stiff lumbar scoliosis. She had a two-stage procedure with an anterior procedure for the lumbar curve, approaching the curve from the left, taking out the discs and shortening it, and then at a second stage, a week later, a thoracotomy where the kyphosis was loosened from the front and then a posterior fusion was performed, restoring the spine to good coronal and sagittal balance using hybriding plants, wires, screws, and hooks. Here's a case of hyperlordosis associated with cerebral palsy where the spine is approached from the left side, shortening the left side and anteriorly and restoring spinal alignment. And here's a case of mild dysplasia where an anterior fusion is used to gain anterior fusion and 
a posterior fusion and instrumentation. Here's a, a boy who was paralyzed in an auto accident at the age of three. He developed scoliosis as he w has a 100% chance of doing and was adequately treated in a brace until the age of 10 which he hit, he, when he hit his growth spurt and then had a spinal fusion. We've advanced today in some places, in some cases, where we can hold the spine very strongly with the use of pedicle screws. Here's a child with cerebral palsy scoliosis, which regressed from the age of eight to 13. And you can see the two films in the middle are his sitting position with correction and traction on the right. And he was treated with a posterior fusion with an all screw implants and hooks cranially with good restoration of coronal and sagittal balance. We've also advanced in how we treat people with difficult curves. If we put somebody in a brace and the brace doesn't work, we used to just have to do a fusion. Here's a child with cerebral palsy who has a large curve, stiff and difficult to control in a brace. So we put implants in without doing a fusion, except for where the hooks may be. And then these rods have got a area where we can lengthen the rods every six months. Or to go one step further, to the child with cerebral palsy, where the rods are fixed to the spine cranially, to the pelvis caudally, and the the area for lengthening is actually magnetically controlled and he comes in every four months and using an external magnet, the rods can be lengthened. All these surgical procedures are not without problems and a lot of challenges. There's a high complication rate in all reports of cerebral palsy, some as high as 70% high blood loss and high infection rates, some cases as high as 56%. So how do we get around this? Firstly, studies show that the case complexity relates to the chance of having a complication. This is a study showed that with these four factors, if a child just had one factor, was nonverbal, the complication rate was 12%. If a child had all four of those, complication rate went as high as 50%. Of the, all the complications we face as surgeons, the most feared is paralysis. And this has been minimized by the routine use of spinal cord monitoring. We've learned in these complex cases that we cannot assess the child by one person. We need a team approach. As Sarah Winter has shown us with one of her early publications, nutritional assessment of these children with a pre-albumin is very important. And studies have shown that with the improved nutrition, you lower the infection rate, they have shorter hospitalizations and shorter intubation. This is a study done by, from Vitali in New York. We looked at things related to infection and he did a Delphi study and the ones that are marked are the things that are important and the things that we have adapted. At Gillette, we have what we call PREPARE, which is a pre-procedure assessment and risk evaluation. The pediatrician assesses the child, assesses nutrition, and sees if the child needs to see another specialist, cardiologist, respiratory. If the child has myelomeningocele or spinal cord injury, we routinely do urine cultures two weeks preoperatively pre and treat the infection. 
all patients preoperatively the night before surgery get a chlorhexidine scrub. We do routine MRSA nasal cultures and we routinely use an antibiotic to see if this is going to make a dis difference in our studies. We use perioperative antibiotics preoperatively, regular intraoperative dosing using dual antibiotics with a lot of wound irrigation, vancomycin powder in the bone graft, wound care, and then treatment of infections with the vac, the vacuum assistant closure system. Does this make a difference? This is the study from Gillette showing our infection rate using an implementation of this over the last four years. You can see in the blue line the total infection rate for all spine fusions has fallen. Most dramatically, if you look at the green bars, for children with neuromuscular scoliosis. Blood loss in these cases are high, long fusion, pure tissue, they need fusion to the sacrum, and children on Depocaine have abnormal platelet function. So any child on Depocaine, we change the anti-epileptic, and then we do a bleeding time and platelet function. We're getting to routinely use antifibrinolytics, and we routinely use the cell saver. Postoperative care has also been improved with what's happened with the PICU, with intensivists, the respiratory team, and pediatricians. The question is, so what? Does this all make a difference? always helping these children. Outcome studies have been done on all diagnoses. Patients, when they can respond, answer the questionnaires, or we get the answers from parents and caretakers, and we use a multiple of outcome measures. If we look at cerebral palsy, numerous studies show that the parents, caretakers, and when the child can answer, they are satisfied with the surgical results. They report improved sitting, decreased pain, increased and activities for daily living, and care is better. If we look at a study of all cases of neuromuscular scoliosis with misdiagnoses, sorry, mixed diagnoses, a prospective study with an average seven-year follow-up. It has shown that these children had improved lung function, sitting of abilities, and ADL. A comparative study was done on two groups of cerebral palsy, GMFCS4 and 5s, where half were observed and half had surgery. At a two-year follow-up, the observed cases had increased curve and increased pelvic obliquity and decreased outcome measures. The surgical patients, the outcome measures improved, they increased the ability to participate, and their pain decreased. In cases of Duchenne's and SMA, studies showed increased cosmesis, quality of life, satisfaction, sitting balance, and pain. And most importantly, in pulmonary function in Duchenne's, Galasco has shown very well that in the, if you look at a group of patients who refused surgery in blue, with those underwent surgery in pink, on the left, the curve increased with time, this is a seven year follow up, in the untreated cases and was stabilized in the treated cases and pulmonary functions will normally decrease in Duchenne's over time, which you see in the upper graph on the right, but a much larger decrease in the untreated cases. So in Sony, neuromuscular scoliosis is a complex problem, difficult to treat, 
and non-operative treatment is successful in controlling the deformity. Surgical treatment in a lot of cases is the definitive treatment. We've had great technical advances, but there's still a high complication rate, and we've made advances to minimize these complications. So in summary, it's a successful surgery with a high satisfaction and improved outcomes. Thank you. John, I'm sorry, but I think in order to get our program back on track, I'm going to say that you're going to stay later and answer their questions okay. in person, Pleasure. okay? But you can stay up here as, as um, we invite our next, or, or, go ahead, sit down. I'd like to invite our next, our guests to come on up. As a part of our um, annual program, we want to highlight our partnerships with our partner organizations in Europe and um, with the Australasian Academy. So uh, today I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, Nana Tatashvili. Uh, she is um, a professor of neurology, head of neuroscience department at Central Children's Hospital in Tbilisi, Georgia. She's president of the Georgian Association of Child Neurology and Neurosurgery, and that's not the state of Georgia, the country of Georgia. <laughs> um, her research and practices in includes pediatric epilepsy, stroke, and neurodevelopmental disorders. And she is the president of EACD 2018, which will take place in her capital city of Tbilisi in May. And we'd like to hear from her now about that meeting. Thanks. Okay, thank you for giving me possibility for inviting me and giving me possibility to update the future meeting of European Academy. It will be, I have no disclosure for the presentation, and will take place in Georgia. It's not the state of Georgia, it's a Republic of Georgia, which is in Black Sea Shore, it's a small country with beautiful nature, mountains, valleys, and so on. And the slogan of our future meeting is uh, together we are stronger and we hope to share our values and experiences with European, with North American, and all other countries, including our region, which has many problems, and regional countries will also share their experiences how to deal with many of the problems. So, important days, uh, call for abstract is already open. In October 1st, we will start conference registration, and the deadline for the early registration will be March 15. And the conference will be from the 28th of May, including 31st of the May. We have program at glance, and you can see that the structure of conference is typical for European Academy conferences, including instructional courses, keynote lectures, and also we will have the controversies, which is a very important and uh, discussion type of the um, workshop with uh, very high topics that are of very high interest in the audience. Also, we have very good and uh, active uh, com scientific committee, which is chaired by Bernard Dunn, who presents here, and we hope that we will have very interesting, uh, detailed program. Uh, 
registration fees are quite low if to compare with uh, developed countries and also we have some uh, reduced registration fees for regional and some other post-Sovietic countries to give more possibility to people from these regions to uh, participate in the conference. The committee has suggested diversity to be main topic, so you can see here that we have open list of topics for free communication. Also, ICF model will be favored, and uh, suggested topics includes many of the interesting topics that are listed below. I will not stop on each of them and also wide range of conditions will be of interest, including many neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, we will have very interesting joint meetings, joint meeting with International Society of Early Intervention, also with European Pediatric Neurology Society and mini symposia with uh, International League Against Epilepsy. Speakers are also diverse from diverse continents and countries from United States of America, North America, you can see and know, I hope, all of them, from Australia, from Europe also, and also regional speakers who will present very interesting presentations, we hope. Tbilisi is easily accessible, safe, and quite cheap country with a beautiful nature, and there are many direct flights from different directions, and the number of these flights is increasing every month, and we have quite a good value. It's a Hualing Tbilisi C Plaza hotel with all equipment and facilities for good big meeting. And now, please, video. I have one minute video to give you impression of the, our country with its culture, with its uh, good food and fantastic dances and so on. Please, video. What are you looking for this summer? Delicate Europe. Breathtaking seashores. Modern infrastructure. Untamed nightlife. Wild nature. Divine relaxation. Exotic culture. Or maybe you want it all. Summer in Georgia. So, fantastic dances, which is celebration of life of Georgia's rich and diverse culture. And so Tbilisi is a city that loves you, and I hope if you come, you will love Tbilisi also. There is a, a website, our website, so you can see details on there. Thank you for your patience. And not to be outdone, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, who, from the Australasian Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, Dr. James Rice. Dr. Rice is the current president of the Australasian Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, whose membership includes 400 clinicians and researchers working in the field of child disability in the Asia Pacific region. Dr. Rice is head of the Pediatric Rehabilitation Department at the Women and Children's Hospital in Adelaide. Dr. Rice. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, this is the second uh, time I've had the opportunity to represent the Academy, and I'm uh, delighted to have the opportunity. I'll never forget the first uh, time, which was last year, because I was following on straight after Mike Massal, and that was uh, memorable in terms of getting that opportunity to get up on stage after Mike's award. 
Um, the reason that we have an opportunity to uh, present is as part of what is called the leadership exchange between the uh, Australasian Academy and the American Academy, and we're particularly grateful uh, for that uh, opportunity because it gives us um, the uh, reason really to be here and to spend time with the leadership of your academy and to learn so much. We are a young academy. Uh, we're only about 16 or 17 years old and we've only held eight meetings. So we're still uh, growing and we have a lot to learn. However, we are uh, busy with our growth and with uh, coming up with new ideas. And one of the things that we have done in the last uh, few months is to launch our website. And I'd uh, really encourage you to have uh, a look at our website, uh, since we're talking a lot about uh, multimedia today. Um, and it's really uh, given us, um, I guess, a, a real way forward in terms of presenting uh, all the work that we do, particularly as we grow into a more of a multimedia format but it really helps explain who we are and what we do, and uh, we're very grateful for the support that we've had in um, doing that, so please have a look. I showed this last year, so I'll just be very brief about it. As opposed to your, I think, 11 or 12 committees, we have five. Um, we have our, a chair of each of those committees who uh, is a board, uh, along with a board member um, and directors at large sit on our board. Uh, we have a scientific uh, conference committee who are busy working towards uh, presenting our next conference, which I'll mention. And really just to update you on what our, our portfolios have been doing, we have a, um, a advocacy and awards group who are particularly working on uh, our cerebral palsy strategy that we're undertaking with other partners in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they also do a lot of advocacy and they're coming up with some new awards for our meeting uh, next year, as well as running a family day that day. We have a professional development website group. Uh, we only have a second, every second yearly meeting. So in the off year, we work with other groups to um, run some professional development activities. Uh, they also manage our website and help with our uh, new e-newsletters. As you heard this morning, we are part of the International Alliance and we're working uh, very hard on that as a, as a new um, member. Uh, but we also are working with our partners in surrounding countries and at our meeting we'll be introducing a mentor program for our visitors from overseas and continuing to work to establish links with other academies. Our scientific education group are working on guidelines and position statements and they uh, work with the organising committee in convening a scientific committee and have been very busy in the last few weeks in uh, finalising our conference program. And finally we have a membership and finance uh, group who are, are working hard at the moment on redefining our membership categories but importantly for the increased amount uh, of subscription that our members will pay to ensure that they uh, receive greater benefits. This is the um, flyer for our conference. You receive one of these in your, um, in your satchel. We're running our next conference in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, it'll be in March, which, which is really in the late summer in New Zealand. It'll be a wonderful time uh, to be at uh, that conference in New Zealand. Um, and I just share with you the fact that uh, in comparison to what most of us have done to travel to the eastern part of the United States, it's really just a short overnight flight to New Zealand. I, you can look for yourselves how long it actually is, but I can tell you But by the time you've woken up in the morning, you'll be in the wonderful land of New Zealand uh, for a great conference. Uh, just quickly as we finish, um, we've had uh, really amazing interest in this conference. Uh, the submissions have closed. We actually had 300 abstracts submitted for the conference from 22 countries. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't accept uh, all of those, but we're able to present a format that probably looks very similar to what uh, you have here this week in our pre-conference workshops, um, breakfast sessions and instructional courses, uh, 120 uh, papers and posters. And we make sure you'll also have a good time with our social event. Um, that is all from me. Thank you very much. You'll, you'll be seeing a new president next year, so I'm very grateful. But I just have one quick housekeeping note, if you don't mind, and that's from uh, one of our partners, and that's from the CP Foundation, just to say that the uh, CP Channel app is now available in the App Store. Thank you very much.
<laughs> and now it's time to enjoy a short break um, as you, uh, and then go off to your instructional courses. Please remember to vote for the best life shots and the best demonstration poster. We'll see you at the Wine and Cheese and exhibit review this evening. And don't forget your visit and win card. Thanks. Okay.